Well, uh, welcome everybody to uh, Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. We're just delighted to have you uh, for yet another exciting presentation. Um, we really just want you all to feel engaged and informed about uh, all the medical programming that's going on around the world with Samaritan's Purse. Before we get started today, if you remember that you'll have a chat box to the right of your screen and uh, just encourage you to use that. In fact, in the beginning, if you'll just type in your name and your location, uh, we'll have a better idea who's uh, with us today. And uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you uh, for uh, this opportunity, this platform uh, to come together, Lord, just to, uh, to learn with one another, to learn about uh, COVID-19, this uh, deadly pandemic that has just uh, circled the world and um, has really called us to the forefront, Lord, just to serve clinically and just to um, uh, serve others, uh, Lord, physically and spiritually. Lord, thank you for these presenters today and just uh, the uh, audience uh, with us. Just bless this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's my delight to introduce to you today three presenters. If you'll recall back in April, we had our first presentation live from New York City about uh, COVID and our response in uh, both Italy and, uh, and, and New York. And uh, we wanted to follow up to provide more information to you today. Um, you know, COVID-19, where are we going? Where is Samaritan's Purse going? And so with that, I'd like to introduce our three presenters. Uh, first, we'll have uh, Ben O'Neill. Uh, ben is the uh, Samaritan's Purse uh, Medical Out uh, Outbreak Specialist. As a member of the International Health Unit, Ben has served uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, during our Ebola response. He's also a subject matter expert on outbreak preparedness and response programming. And uh, he is our uh, epidemiologist for the COVID-19 pandemic response. Ben has worked as a uh, program manager and advisor uh, for our country offices uh, in Liberia and Uganda. And he also served as the county epidemiologist in Redding, California. Uh, after Ben presents, uh, we will have Dr. James Brown just very excited to have Jim with us today. Uh, Jim is well known to uh, Samaritan's Purse. Uh, he has, or he is serving as a missionary uh, general surgeon at Mbingo uh, Hospital in Cameroon. That's one of our World Medical Mission partner hospitals. Um, he's served there for 12 years with his wife. He is currently serving as the chief of surgery for PACS or Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. And, um, uh, Dr. Brown also recently deployed with our DART team to New York City, uh, where he served for about five weeks uh, at our respiratory care unit. So delighted to hear his um, presentation about the clinical response today. And then finally, we'll have Melanie Wubbs wrap things up. Melanie is well known to much of the listening audience. She is currently a technical uh, health specialist uh, for Samaritan's Purse International Health Unit. Uh, she has been involved in a very wide array of uh, various DART responses uh, over the years. Um, uh, specifically, uh, she was involved as serving in the medical director uh, during our Mosul uh, uh, response in, in Iraq with our field hospital there. Uh, she also served at our diphtheria treatment center in Bangladesh with the Rohingya Muslims. Uh, she served uh, in the uh, field hospital at, uh, in Freeport, uh, Bahamas, most recently during that devastation. And then finally, uh, just uh, lastly, uh, she uh, did serve uh, in uh, New York City at our respiratory care unit. Uh, Melanie is very passionate about uh, facilitating effective quality teams who deliver uh, compassionate, Christ-centered care. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our three speakers. Ben, I'll turn it to you. Thank you very much, Lance. Uh, thank you all for joining us for the second spiff on COVID-19. Uh, and uh, like Lance said, I would encourage you to go back and listen to uh, the last one. Uh, um, I am our medical outbreak specialist at SP International Health Unit. And um, yes, I'm very excited to, to share with you uh, what's happened since the last uh, um, presentation and, and where we see it kind of going forward from here. Um, okay. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, since the last uh, spiff on 
in April 13th on, on COVID uh, when we had the RCUs deployed in New York City and Italy. Uh, the European epicenter to the outbreak has eased, especially in Western Europe and the USA outbreak has finally started to improve in, in most states. Uh, the exception to Europe would be uh, like Belarus and Sweden. Um, and in, of course in the USA, it is a, a different state to state. Uh, we can talk about that more later. Um, while the number of daily reported deaths globally from COVID has reduced, fears are mounting that the true measure of un uncounted deaths could be much higher as we compare unexplained deaths this year uh, that far exceed previous years. Um, moreover, some estimates of the potential cost of lives lost through delayed routine vaccinations and primary care may exceed those lost to the pandemic uh, directly. Most concerns mount over for the food insecurity and malnutrition resulting from economic consequences of lockdowns and travel restrictions in low income countries. Uh, recently, the number of new cases reported now uh, more often than not exceeds 100,000 per day. In fact, uh, uh, yesterday, as the uh, global uh, cumulative case is, uh, reached 8.3 million and deaths reached uh, 447,000, um, the, the single, we reached a new single highest day, uh, new cases at 142,557 uh, and uh, a spike in, in new deaths at 6,592. Um, so uh, it, uh, although the deaths continue to go down, um, it, that's not uh, for certain. And there is likely a lot of missing deaths as well. Uh, new slide. Or sorry, next slide, yeah. Um, so trends in the global spread. Uh, as you can kind of see from the three colors, or four, five colors here, uh, part of the reason for the concern about the next phase of the pandemic is that it is moving into the global south where the populations uh, of many countries are vulnerable due to political insecurity, poor health systems, and less capacity in the outbreak surveillance and response systems. As you can see in this chart, as North America, mostly the USA and some Canada and Europe reduce in cases, Latin America and Asia have, uh, have made up more and more of this um, uh, in uh, cases going forward. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the top five countries, and these are actually still holding true even though I, I this data is from a, a week ago. Um, Brazil has overtaken the USA in the uh, number of new cases being reported daily. Uh, USA is experiencing a slow reduction in the cases uh, counted, uh, partly due to improvements in testing and partly due to differing outbreak dynamics by state. Um, however, as you kind of pay attention in the news, about 20 states are experiencing uh, an uptick in, in cases lately um, due to um, a reopening of some states, um, you know, so more movement, um, you know, and, and, and less, or less uh, uh, behaviors that uh, can reduce transmission. So um, we, we don't know that that's going to uh, necessarily uh, stop all the progress that's being made, but it has slowed it down. Um, note there is significant reduction in the y-axis uh, per day for Russia, India, and Peru compared to that of US and Brazil. It's just much smaller. So like Russia only gets up to about 10,000 cases, which is like the very low end of the USA uh, line. Um, although Russia uh, until recently had the second highest number of cases, they rarely uh, made it higher than 10,000 new cases per day. Um, India holds one sixth of the world's population and is, in, is rapidly increasing in new cases daily. Um, about, um, uh, about a quarter of their cases are in Mumbai uh, specifically. Um, Peru uh, has been rapidly increasing as well, reaching 9,000 new cases in a single day and, and that's uh, even higher now. Um, next slide, please. So then we'll move into by, by the, the regions that we see uh, continuing to, to increase as hotspots, uh, Latin American countries. Um, so those with the highest numbers in the last two weeks, um, 
would be, um, we already went through Brazil and Peru, of course, but uh, those with more than 100,000 cases are Brazil. Brazil Still, those are more than 50,000 cases in the last two weeks. Uh, Peru and Chile, uh, more than 10,000. Mexico, Colombia, and Argentina, uh, more than 5,000 would be Bolivia, Ecuador, Panama, and Dominican Republic. Uh, of those, uh, only Ecuador seems to be decreasing in cases, like they've already hit their peak. The rest of them are still increasing in cases. Um, uh, and Brazil, of course, is... Um, one that we we are all worried about and, and maybe matching the USA in cases eventually uh, overall. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next region is Asia. Um, the The Arabian Peninsula has had a just a really hard month, um, uh, and but not only them, but uh, the the Middle East overall and into. India has uh, had a lot of cases recently. We already mentioned India is one of the top five for a number of new cases. Um, you know, they've had, they have over 100,000 total cases. Um, but Peru, uh, Pakistan has greater than 50,000 cases. Um, Iran, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, Kuwait, and Oman have more than 10,000 cases. Afghanistan, uh, the Emirates, Indonesia, Iraq, Philippines, Singapore, and Bahrain have more than 5,000. Um, among those, Kuwait, uh, the Emirates, and Singapore seem to be decreasing. Um, one of the unique ones there, of course, is Iran, which um, seems to be having a second um, uh, rise uh, in cases. Uh, Singapore similarly had one of those um, it related to um, uh, immigrant populations. Uh, who are sorry migrant workers uh who uh who live and work there uh next slide please and then africa so after uh currently we know that latin america and the middle east are are in in, in asia are the um are southeast uh, south asia are, are the ones experiencing uh outbreaks right now Africa will come after them. South of Africa is our, in, in, in Egypt, of course, have already been having uh, difficult uh, outbreaks. Um, Egypt, one of the older ones, because it's kind of included in the Mediterranean outbreaks uh, as Europe was, was going off. But South Africa has, has already been um, experiencing heavy numbers because of the um, dependence of South Africa on Europe and, and, and the frequent travel. Um, so especially in the Cape Town region, um, but um, the, we expect Africa uh, to pick up, um, and, it, and it are, across the continent it has, but each individual country has not hit those high number thresholds that, that we, we look for, with the exception of South Africa and Egypt. But here you can kind of see um, some of the countries that we, we are uh, watching as, as, as quickly growing, um, Cameroon, Nigeria, Sudan. Um, and of course, one of the problems in, in this region is that we, we worry that there is an underreporting, that there are co-infections, that we don't know how big a factor um, things like malnutrition will have um, in these cases. Um, so we are, uh, we are watching, we, we, we also, um, are, are watching to see the effect of their climates on the outbreak as well. Um, but yes, the, this is this is the area we expect to um, to come after um, the the current outbreaks in in Latin America and Asia. Um, next slide, please. Um, so other up, other epi type updates uh, in the news. Uh, there there's been debate about asymptomatic transmissions. Um, you you might have seen um, the the WHO said that asymptomatic transmissions were very very rare, and then they then they walked that back. Um, that that was because there was a, a couple studies out of Taiwan, sorry Taiwan and Germany that showed that there was very uh, as they were following uh, a lot of patients, there was very little asymptomatic spread that they could find. The CDC, on the other hand, estimates that up to 40% of transmissions may occur while people don't have symptoms. Now, um, and then in Germany, they, they wanted to differentiate between what, what they call posse symptomatic uh, spread, which is people who are very mildly symptomatic uh, or 
atypically symptomatic. Um, so it's, it's, it's more of a, um, a differentiation in how we are using the term asymptomatic. Uh, are you using asymptomatic to refer to pre-symptomatic people because they don't currently have symptoms or uh, as, as a more broad term, or are you differentiating between pre-symptomatic people who will eventually experience symptoms or may not realize that they are having symptoms or are you um, and, and versus asymptomatic people who will never have symptoms, more the carrier type uh, approach. Um, I, I, I've only seen the CDC actually lump the two together. Um, and these studies from Taiwan and Germany uh, attempted to, to separate the two and show that um, while there, while the people, while uh, infectivity uh, rises uh, as you get closer to symptom onset, um, which w w makes sense. Um, um, we don't see those who never get symptoms uh, transmitting, um, mostly because, uh, as you would expect, the viral load doesn't go up if you're able to fight it enough to not have symptoms. But uh, further studies need to be uh, done uh, more broadly. The, the, uh, another news item was uh, public masking being recommended broadly. Uh, the CDC did this a while back. The WHO has followed suit uh, recently. Um, there, was a, there was a big study that came out. Um, um, uh, uh, a, um, a, uh, uh, on, on the effect um, uh, of community masking. It's important to think about the transmission, transmissibility of exposure over time. Uh, this is why we ask that um, it, if you have been within six feet of someone for, um, with COVID for 15 minutes, but as we've seen with, uh, with choirs, for instance, uh, you can be farther away than six feet if your exposure is longer. Um, similarly, uh, a mask may decrease the amount of uh, distance particles can travel or even the amount of particles that travel. But if you decrease the distance between you and the person or increase the amount of time with that person, such as in a work environment or public transportation, you may still be exposed to enough virus to be infected. This is why masks alone are not sufficient to protect you from COVID. Um, uh, and then uh, another, um, another point that has been in news lately is, are there multiple strains? Um, so genetic mutations are very common, especially in RNA type viruses. Um, and they're very common and they can be detrimental, they can be neutral, or they can be advantageous for the virus. Uh, what would be significant is if enough changes have occurred that the human body would not recognize or react to the virus uh, as, an, as a new serotype, uh, not recognizing it as the same virus and, and thus damaging what much of the work that's being done in uh, vaccine development. So far, we don't have evidence that this has occurred. Um, so that is it. That is, those are the epi updates that we have right now. Um, uh, I, I want to hand it over next uh, to Dr. Brown, um, and thank you for your time. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Uh, next slide. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the most critically uh, ill patients with COVID disease in two parts, res respiratory care of these patients and complications of COVID-19 as they occur in the ICU. Next slide. Okay, so we know that um, most patients that are infected with COVID virus do not require hospitalization. And many in fact are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. But the primary reason for hospitalization is uh, for patients that require supplemental oxygenation. And these are also the patients that require monitoring and surveillance for progression of their disease. Many patients are, uh, hypox have hypoxia out of proportion to their symptoms. And pneumonia is the uh, most severe complication of uh, COVID disease. The World Health Organization initially set the therapeutic target for oxygen saturation at 90%, but we learned over time that we could accept uh, lower saturations even in the upper 80s if necessary. Next slide. There are now classic uh, radiographic findings on chest X-ray and CT scan for COVID pneumonia and the so-called ground glass chest X-ray, which shows these bilateral hazy infiltrates. And on CT scan, 
um, we see the bilateral interstitial infiltrates in the lower lobes of both lungs. Uh, next, next slide. Patients with minimal oxygen requirements usually uh, can be treated with just a nasal cannula, which can give up to six liters per minute of oxygen. But as the oxygen requirement increases, a uh, simple face mask or a Venturi mask or a non-rebreather mask, each can give an increasing amount of oxygen. Uh, but patients that need uh, high flow oxygen or high pressure oxygen are best treated with a high flow nasal cannula or with uh, CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. With CPAP, you can give up to 90% uh, FiO2 with uh, 15 centimeters of water pressure in the lungs. And this is uh, very effective in increasing the patient's oxygen level. CPAP requires a well-fitting mask with a good seal around the nose and the mouth. It also requires the patient's cooperation. And these patients who are always, almost always very anxious, uh, that can be very difficult for them. There's no evidence at this time that CPAP um, can avoid intubation, but we learned from our experience in New York that there were some patients that we think avoided intubation by aggressive use of, of CPAP. Early on, uh, as the, the world was getting experience with COVID pneumonia, early intubation was recommended because so many of these patients would deteriorate very suddenly without warning. But we then later also learned that mechanical ventilation itself seemed to have uh, increased morbidity and mortality independent of the severity of the patient's disease. So we try very hard uh, to avoid in, uh, intubating and using mechanical ventilation unless it's clearly indicated. I think each hospital should establish protocols for the best oxygen delivery based on individual patients' needs. But when you get to the level of an intubating or more invasive techniques, I think that decision is best made by a multidisciplinary team of ICU staff, including doctors, ICU nurses, uh, anesthetists, and respiratory therapists. Next slide. So a well-prepared methodical approach to intubation is far superior to the hectic crash intubation, but uh, even knowing this, it's sometimes very difficult to know uh, when you actually have to intubate. I've listed here uh, some of the pretty clear indications for intubation, a rapid deterioration over one to two hours or no improvement with uh, maximum non-invasive techniques. If a patient has a sustained respiratory rate of greater than 40, or if they're using their accessory chest wall muscles to breathe, then that's also indication that they're, they're probably going to tire out. Patients that develop hemodynamic instability or multi-organ failure or an altered mental status with a Glasgow coma scale of less than eight are all pretty good indications for intubation. It's important if you can to have a discussion about intubation in advance with the patient and with their family um, because the intubation represents a, a big escalation in the patient's care. An intubation is thought to be the procedure in the ICU that carries uh, the greatest risk to the staff because it uh, has the highest risk of aerosolation of airborne uh, droplets. And it should be performed in a negative pressure um, environment if that's possible. Um, next slide. In preparing for intubation, you should have some kits put together that have a number of different sizes of endotracheal tubes and oral and nasal airways, stylets, uh, you want to have uh, different kinds of laryngoscope blades and make sure that the lights work. Uh, you also want to have available uh, suction machine that you've tested, an oxygen source, and a bag mask apparatus for pre-ventilation and pre-oxygenation. All medications should be drawn up in advance and labeled. Um, it's important to have a tracheostomy kit or tray available, and the crash cart and the def defibrillator should be nearby in case there's an arrest. Um, Everyone should be in full PPE and the minimum number of staff uh, required should, should be in the room. Those that aren't necessary should not be there. And it's important that intubation be performed by the member of the team that has the most experience because these patients are fragile and they don't tolerate multiple attempts at intubation. Pre-oxygenation with 100% oxygen should be done, preferably with two people, one person providing a seal with the mask, the other person providing the ventilation. And it's the anesthetist that gives the order to give the medications. The ventilator should be set up in advance. And it's uh, the best way to be sure that the tube is in the right place is to have an inline capnometer to measure the expired uh, carbon dioxide. 
Um, also important was having inline suction with the endotracheal tube rather than having to disconnect the endotracheal tube to provide suctioning, and which would just uh, increase aerosolation of droplets and also takes away the PEEP. You want to get a chest x-ray to make sure the tube is in the right place. And the initial ventilator settings are usually set fairly high with an FiO2 of 100%, um, PEEP at 10 to 12, respiratory rate of 14, a tidal volume on the low side, six milliliters per kilogram of the ideal body weights recommended, remembering that the ideal body weight is actually determined by the patient's height, not their actual weight. And there should be a chart in the ICU uh, for quick reference as to what the ideal body weight is. Once the tube is in, um, get an arterial blood gas. The uh, oxygen saturation level is, is uh, quite reliable in making uh, adjustments in oxygen delivery. But an arterial blood gas allows you to check for hypercarbia and for acidosis. There's been a lot of talk about using permissive hypercarbia in these patients that is letting the, the PCO2 uh, remain elevated as long as the pH is above 7.15. If the patient is acidotic, especially if there's a metabolic acidosis, uh, we treat that with uh, sodium bicarbonate intravenously rather than adjusting the ventilation. But if the PCO2 remains too high and I I chose a PCO2 of 60, um, then you might increase the minute ventilation by increasing the respiratory rate, but try to keep the tidal volume at six milliliters or below because that's important for avoiding the barotrauma. Um, there are other uh, strategies for managing the ventilator that we don't have time to talk about in this setting. Uh, next slide. But uh, one thing I do want to mention that has showed dramatic improvements in oxygen saturation is proning. That is turning the patient face down um, rather than on their back. <clears throat> this process requires a team and it can be complicated in patients that have uh, multiple tubes and lines, but proning helps match the ventilation with the perfusion in the lungs. It improves oxygenation, but there's not yet proof that it uh, averts intubation or that it accelerates recovery or that it reduces mortality. But I think with time, we're going to find, uh, have evidence that it, uh, that it does. Bronchospasm is usually not a significant component of COVID pneumonia, so that unless a patient has pre-existing asthma or COPD, um, we uh, don't recommend the use of bronchodilators or nebulizer treatments. Pulmonary vasodilators like nitrous oxide have also not been shown to be effective and some patients that max out on the ventilator are candidates for ECMO. ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, but this also requires a team and requires a consult uh, for determining whether patients are actually eligible for it. Next slide. I wanna talk now about complications of COVID in the ICU and give reference to the Society for Critical Care Medicine. Um, there's a link here. You can sign up uh, to get daily or, or frequent updates. I use this more than any other site when I was in New York for going to any question I had about critical care in the ICU. They actually have a whole section for critical care for the non-intensivist, which is what I needed. Um, next slide. So we learned very quickly in the ICU that severe COVID disease affects more organs than just the lungs. Uh, some complications are simply manifestations of pre-existing disease like um, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and diabetes. But we also began to see other complications that we did not expect in forms of multi-organ failure and also a hypercoagulable state that at the beginning we, we didn't really understand or know existed. Um, every medical student learns about Burkhaus triad. Um, this is the, these are the conditions that can cause thromboembolic uh, complications, endothelial damage, stasis, and a hypercoagulable state. And it turns out that um, these conditions are, all three of these conditions are present in COVID patients. There's microscop microscopic evidence of endothelial damage um, uh, directly maybe from the virus or maybe from the cytokines and the inflammatory factors. Uh, these patients are immobilized by their hypoxia or by, their, uh, by being hospitalized, which increases their stasis. And there's a hypercoagulable state manifest by increased in thromboplastic factors like factor VIII and fibrinogen. Many of the patients also have an elevated D-dimer, which is a degradation product of fibrin, and it correlates with the severity of their disease. 
So in severe COVID disease, uh, we found the patients had an increased uh, or an abnormality of clotting. They also had an, an increased risk for bleeding. And this led many investigators to believe that this was DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. But the main clinical finding in COVID was clotting, uh, thrombosis, whereas the non-COVID DIC, the main clinical presentation is bleeding. So these, dis these, these diseases are, are related, but they're not quite the same. But deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary emboli occur in up to a third of patients in the ICU, even those on uh, prophylactic anticoagulation. Autopsies have shown microthrombi in the lungs, the kidneys, the heart, and other organs. And clots are found out in the periphery of the lung, <clears throat> which uh, suggests that these may be thrombi occurring in the lung rather than emboli coming from somewhere else. And microthrombi have <clears throat> been thought maybe to be the mechanism of injury for the cardiomyopathies, the acute renal injury, some of the central nervous system uh, complications that develop. It's more complicated than this uh, because there's also a major inflammatory component uh, that's not yet well understood. But these conditions led to the recommendation to anticoagulate patients with severe disease, that's full anticoagulation, especially those on ventilators and those with markedly elevated D-dimers. The patients not in the ICU and even outpatients with COVID have also been shown to have an increased incidence of venothromboembolism and um, ischemic strokes, myocardial infarction and the like. Next slide. So the approach to, uh, to the thromboembolic disease in COVID patients is, um, it consists of these uh, baseline tests. The tests are mainly used to measure the severity of the disease. They're not necessarily used to manage recommendations for anticoagulation. Uh, imaging studies are not recommended in asymptomatic patients, <clears throat> but for a patient with a suspected DVT, the uh, compression ultrasonography is the choice. For suspected pulmonary embolism, the best study is a TT angiogram. But these are not easy to get in these patients that are in the ICU, multiple lines, some of them not stable. What we found was that a bedside echocardi <clears throat> echocardiogram was very effective in uh, diagnosing pulmonary embolism in a clinically suspected patient. If you see a dilated <clears throat> right heart, or not right heart strain on echocardiogram, we were using that finding alone uh, to treat uh, for pulmonary embolism. So all hospitalized patients with COVID, both that's medical, surgical, and obstetric, should be on um, venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. Um, but ICU patients on ventilators with multi-organ failure, severe disease, all of those should be on full anticoagulation. And patients with a documented DVT or pulmonary embolism or have abnormal clotting in their access lines should be fully anticoagulated. Next slide. We used uh, thrombolytic therapy in patients that had acute pulmonary embolism. Uh, the drug we used was the tissue plasminogen activator or TPA. Um, it's also indicated for limb-threatening deep vein thrombosis and in some acute strokes, some myocardial infarctions. But it's important to have the advice of an intensivist before initiating this treatment so that a, a cardiologist, the pulmonologist, the, uh, the neurologist would be the ones that directed the treatment. And also, um, we... Uh, we recommended that TPA not be used in uh, patients in, uh, with just severe hypoxia in the absence of evidence of a hypercoagulable state. Next slide. We saw many increased uh, complications from cardiac, um, cardiac complications, including more arrhythmias, most commonly atrial arrhythmias, some, some ventricular tachycardia, recommendation is you treat those with standard ACLS protocols and also as uh, we all know the, the underlying conditions of hypoxia and acidosis and electrolyte abnormalities, all that needs to be carefully monitored. There was an increased incidence of myocardial infarction and cardiomyopathy. There was a cardiomyopathy was seen without focal uh, infarction, thought maybe to be due to microembolic disease, not sure about that that every patient that is in the ICU needs to be on an EKG monitor. They need to have a 12 lead EKG as a baseline. Paid a lot of attention to QT intervals, mainly because 
some of the medications that were being used early on would prolong the QT interval and put patients at increased increased risk for uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Next slide. Up to 60% of ventilated patients in the ICU with COVID uh, get some degree of acute kidney injury. Um, the acute kidney injury of COVID resembles the acute tubular necrosis, which is a, a, a common cause of acute renal failure from other kinds of injury. But the treatment is adequate volume replacement. You wanna keep the patient dry, but not too dry. Uh, judicious use of, of diuretics, potassium binding residents for patients with um, high with hyperkalemia and uh, sodium bicarbonate for metabolic acidosis. Next slide. But even uh, with these measures, many patients will need dialysis. And there was a time in New York when uh, there was more concern about uh, lack of dialysis machines than lack of ventilators because so many patients went on to need uh, hemodialysis. I've listed here the indications for hemodialysis. Um, fluid overload, hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, uremia, severe oligonuria. And this can be done at the bedside. These, uh, these uh, machines now are portable enough to come into the patient's room in the ICU. We had to refer our patients um, in, when we were in New York, but this, that was a common reason that we actually had to refer patients was because of renal failure. Peritoneal dialysis is not recommended if hemodialysis is available. Next slide. So we tried hard to avoid fluid overload uh, in order to keep the lungs from being wet and impairing oxygenation more. Uh, we had no routine use of uh, maintenance fluids or boluses without proven need in the patient. Monitored the cardiac or the urine output very carefully. We found that bedside ultrasound used uh, looking at the inferior vena cava was a very effective way to assess for volume status so that if the IVC was flat or less than one centimeter, you could assume the patient was dry if it was between one and two centimeters and you could see good respiratory variation in the inferior vena cava, that, that was about where you wanted them to be. If it was more than two centimeters and looked very tense, then that implied the patient had volume overload. But you had to be careful with that because patients with right heart strain and pulmonary emboli can have a dilated right heart but still have uh, um, be intravascularly depleted. So we treated hypotension uh, with an initial bolus of 300 to 500 cc's of isotonic crystal, crystalloid. If the patient's unresponsive to fluids, we began to a vasopressor, the first choice being norepinephrine, uh, second being um, vasopressin, the third epinephrine. Avoided dopamine, you want to titrate the uh, mean arterial pressure to greater than 65. And then as you can get the patients off the pressors, you want to do that as soon as you can. We had a low threshold for using central venous lines, especially for patients that have, um, uh, we're getting pressors. Um, next slide. Neurologic injuries, many different kinds of uh, complications of, of these COVID patients, including stroke, embolic and thrombotic strokes, subarachnoid bleeds, also, these patients sometimes get a sort of global CNS injury. Um, it, it, it manifests itself by um, decreased uh, response, uh, not following commands, not being aware, not, not seem to, seeming to comprehend. It might be an anoxic brain injury, um, not clear on that. And ICU delirium is a big problem in patients, especially those that have prolonged intubation and are immobile and uh, socially isolated like these patients are. There's a whole list of uh, protocols that could be uh, initiated to help offset uh, ICU delirium. Next slide. So nutrition was also very important. Uh, all patients on a ventilator had a nasogastric tube for uh, tube feedings. Uh, glycemic control is uh, one of the um, foundations of the surviving sepsis protocol and it's important to uh, control the blood sugar even if that requires an insulin drip, which it does sometimes. Initially, we were told to not use steroids. There was uh, not evidence from prior um, viral out, um, epidemics that it was that were effective. Um, just two days ago, <clears throat> there was a study from the UK that was um, reported uh, the first study that shows there was a uh, survival benefit for using low-dose uh, dexamethasone, six milligrams a day, 
on patients that are, had severe COVID disease. So there actually may be some benefit, uh, but in selected patients, and we're waiting to get a little more information on that. We're also told initially to avoid uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They were thought to be an upregulator for the ACE2 receptor, which is the site of entry for the uh, virus into the body. But I, that's, it's not, I'm not really sure about that. And uh, I also recently saw a study, this uh, prospective study being done in the UK using ibuprofen uh, in a controlled study to see whether or not the anti-inflammatory effects are actually beneficial. So we really don't have the answer on that. Acetaminophen is used for fever. Everybody should be on GI prophylaxis with a proton pump inhibitor. For intravenous sedation, propofol is the a, a main drug, although you have to be careful because it can cause hypotension. And uh, in that case, we would recommend using ketamine or Versed. We try to stay away from um, neuromuscular uh, blockade uh, unless the patient was actually fighting the ventilator. Uh, next slide. And I can't uh, stop without mentioning spiritual care. You know, uh, this is a picture of chaplains at the bedside in a patient with COVID disease. Um, central to what we do is that we care about uh, communicating the gospel. And they're very, uh, this is a very uh, wonderful environment in which we can uh, demonstrate um, compassion. These patients are afraid. These patients are isolated from their families. Breathlessness is a very uh, anxiety producing disorder. So just the physical presence, the environment you create, I believe very much, and I think uh, this is very central, is that you know, the way we care for patients, both the quality of our care, our professionalism, um, the environment we create uh, with compassion, concern, uh, gives us the credibility uh, to give uh, our message as ambassadors for Christ. Uh, so I'll stop there and, uh, and let Melanie give her presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Um, so Ben has spoken about the epidemiology side of uh, what's new with COVID and Dr. Brown has really spoken quite thoroughly on the clinical treatment. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit more on the side of work, life and ministry in this protracted public health emergency. None of the things that I talk about will be really new to all of you, uh, but I hope by relating some of the lessons and the components that we learned while serving in New York, um, that this can be applied to this new world that we all live, work, practice, and serve in. Next slide. So courage and faith. I'm just gonna read this first from Joshua 1. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is, worth you, is with you wherever you go. God spoke these words to Joshua as they um, were preparing to enter the promised land. COVID can seem like a giant in the land when heading up to New York to do the assessment uh, before the rest of the team joined for the respiratory care unit or to essentially spy out the land. I honestly felt a little bit more like one of the 10 spies who saw the giants and all the obstacles that lay ahead instead of the land of milk and honey that God had promised. As we continue this fight against COVID with not knowing what lies ahead, I just wanna take this opportunity to remind you that courage is faith and faith is believing in the things that have not been seen and knowing that God knows all of those things, that he has a plan and though it may be hard to see, it is there. You may be wondering where that piece of surgical equipment that was scheduled to come with a now canceled team, where it will come from or how kids who are suffering with cleft lip or palate, how they will be healed or how they will get their surgeries. But I encourage you just to rest in this promise given to Joshua by God. Next slide, please. As you navigate these coming months, there may be presented to you new opportunities for partnership. In New York, our work would have not been possible without the really close partnership of Mount Sinai Group of Hospitals. We had never before partnered with a private facility in this way to have a respiratory care unit in Central Park. In COVID, in your environment, it might bring new partners, partners with public health teams, contact tracing, isolation centers, new opportunities to work and serve and uh, to spread the name of Jesus. 
some of the important things to make new partnership work are kind of these five pillars that you'll see here up on your screen. Patient-centered care. Uh, just a reminder for that always to be your focus. Um, sometimes new opportunities can be exciting um, to get the name of your hospital or your organization out there, but just to remember to keep the focus on the patients that you're there to serve. Uh, commitment to excellence, that you form partners and division of labor on the basis of who can accomplish the task with the most amount of excellence to serve those that you're there to uh, serve. Clear communication, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, setting a schedule for communication, especially at the start of a partnership, uh, can be really important. Boundaries. Partners can bring amazing benefits, but it's also really important to establish clear boundaries to ensure in integrity of the work. And ongoing learning, uh, setting aside dedicated time for review of process and then implementing the steps learned there to improve care. These can be really, really hard conversations as you sit down and you might have to admit your weakness or bring up something that you find difficult with a partner that you are working with. I tend to refer these as beefs and bouquets. Um, time to talk about the beefs, the conflicts, um, without accusatory language, but also bo bouquets, celebrating the things that have been done really, really well. Next slide, please. A lot of components of partnership and life, uh, both at home or in the field, in hospitals, living in close community on compounds, um, involves communication. And COVID um, and work in this changing environment can cause communication challenges. Uh, this can be for a number of reasons. Information overload, rumors and suspicion, changes in practice, even basic protocols such as ECLS have had to be modified and communicating that in stressful and quick moving environments can be very challenging. Isolation in units and in life, um, staff on the inside of, of a hot zone are very challenged in, in communicating to the outside world for what is needed to treat patients. Changing teams, uh, maybe someone has had to leave from your hospital or people who were supposed to come to assist with critical matters couldn't come. Um, so these changing teams, different people, different routines can create challenges to communication. And then cultural challenges and language barriers. Um, speaking through a mask and in PPE is hard enough. Um, never mind if you're trying to speak a second language, understand maybe not your first language, or um, in a culture that relies heavily on facial expression um, and nonverbal communication. All of this um, can be very challenging right now. Next slide. Um, so just some strategies to kind of help us work through this. Um, the first one is listen. I cannot stress this one enough. Um, a wise friend once told me, seek first to understand. Um, and that I think is just so, so key. Is fear or shame driving this conflict that you're having with someone? Is that absence from work that you need to communicate about? Is it due to increased home stress or maybe working a second job to create more income to feed their family? Just really stopping before you communicate to understand what someone else might be trying to tell you. Uh, speak truth, be kind and honest with others. Speak concisely. There's so much information out there. If you're the person that's responsible for communicating that to your team, do your best to filter it. So that way the important things do not get lost among just the thousands and thousands of articles and updates that come through each and every day on this and other matters. Repeat the highlights. People's brains are on overload stress, caring for families, high workload, um, repeating important things helps to enforce them. And then lastly, utilizing technology. I know we're all using technology here to um, be involved in this webinar, um, but maybe in your life or your practice, it's just easy to do things the way that you've always done them. But right now might be the time to figure out how could I get an iPad with Zoom or FaceTime to better communicate with patients, family, um, clients, staff. Uh, 
So just kind of seeing what else is out there and available for you. Next slide, please. The impact on infection prevention, control and screening in facilities. Um, so just moving a little bit more to um, the practical side. So essential to personal staff and patient safety is the need for screening, isolation and triage in all healthcare facilities. In COVID specific responses, we have the luxury. Um, I know it might not feel like luxury when you're working in a tent, but we have the luxury of making an entire facility a high risk zone and using PPE appropriately in that way. Uh, but in multi-use facilities that I'm sure many of you work in, that can look very different. Um, so just right here on the screen, you can see on the right side, um, the RCU in New York, and I've added some red lines and that just kind of demarcates the high risk zone which separated the patient care area from the uh, staff support area. Next slide, next slide, please. Um, but in order to promote health for our patients um, all around the world, which will better equip them to deal with COVID, we need to figure out how we can make healthcare facilities safe in order to continue to treat primary healthcare, acute healthcare, like, vet, like Ben mentioned, ensure vaccine programs and everything like that stay um, running in order to just better address the holistic healthcare needs of um, facilities. So in your facility, um, changes might be made to be able to screen patients, to protect staff and patients as best as possible. Um, there's four key steps um, to creating a health um, facility IPC zone, and that's being able to screen, isolate, triage and treat the patients. And that will allow you to function as close as normal for the majority of your patients, but being able to isolate those for treatment who are suspect of who are suspect or confirmed having COVID. Um, as you can see on your screen, this is just kind of a really basic outline of kind of the flow of work that needs to happen. Um, that movement should always be from clean to warm to dirty. You should never go back. Um, the clean zone is the low risk zone uh, where staff or patients with no uh, known risk to have COVID are. And then the dirty zone or the hot zone, the high risk zone where patients are who are confirmed or suspect and where appropriate PPE must be worn. Um, and just making sure you're moving um, from clean to dirty, that you're doffing prior to entering the high risk zone. I'm oh, sorry, you're donning your PPE before entering the high risk zone and then doffing safely afterwards. Next slide, please. Um, another portion of personal safety is self-monitoring. Uh, so just gonna really briefly talk about what this is. Um, it means that you pay attention to your health uh, to become aware very early if you are becoming sick. Um, so you're doing that when you're working with and for the 14 days following working with known or suspect COVID patients. And right now that's all of us. That's all of us who are working in healthcare or living in places where there's active community spread. We should be self monitoring, whether that's taking your temperature each day um, or um, something that we also did in New York um, is oxygen saturation monitoring every other day, just looking for um, atypical, I mean, for atypical uh, low oxygen sats for our staff, um, just as another early sign of COVID. Uh, so yeah, it's taking your temperature or doing the oxygen saturation. Um, and that just really allows for early um, identification if you're feeling sick um, and isolation and testing. So in doing so, you increase your chances of um, early treatment, uh, but you're also really setting um, sorry, you're also really keeping others around you safe, stopping that spread to your family or your, com com or your community. Next slide, please. Self-care. Um, COVID can be all encompassing. As I'm sure if you think back to your life, uh, the last three months, probably the topic you've thought about most, is probably COVID. It's in the media, it affects our family, our work and our lives. Um, and this increases stress. Uh, the demand for healthcare services um, are increasing with possible work force shortages in your area. Um, maybe your healthcare facility was already at capacity and you were struggling. And now suddenly you have an entire new population which you need to also serve. 
uh, there may be a lack of short-term team members who have come to your hospital to assist, or maybe your long-awaited furlough, the rest where you were gonna recharge to come back um, has been canceled. Uh, physical stress can um, take a toll as well as mental stress. There's fear. Um, there's fear of becoming infected or infecting family members. Um, and also there's uh, like stress and fear in the community yourself or healthcare workers that you work with might be stigmatized um, as people fear catching the virus from them. And honestly, the longer COVID drags on or the outbreak in your specific area, the resulting exposure to this prolonged stress uh, and the disruption to really your normal pattern of life will take a toll on your resiliency and your mental health. Uh, so as basic as it sounds, it's really important to take early steps for self-care before we're burned out. Um, and I know a lot of us might tell our family members these things or our patients, uh, but it's really, really important to take these steps for yourself as well. So one of the causes of just kind of this mental stress is the information overload. Uh, so it's really important to stay current with factual COVID information rather than rumors. Uh, but this can take a lot of time. Maybe your Wi-Fi is not great or those hours for sleep are really, really short. I know for myself, um, I have trusted colleagues that do a lot of, re of research. They're much smarter than I am. Uh, so I've asked them and I can rely on them to send me the data, the papers, the actual factual COVID information that I need to be able to do my job. Um, ensure that you understand the steps that you can take, that you can control to keep yourself safe. There's PPE for you. Ensure that you know how to put it on safely. Take it off safely. Doing this one thing that you have control on can um, just greatly decrease your fear or your stress about becoming sick yourself. Um, just other very basic self-care strategies, exercise, healthy sleep patterns, proper nutrition, avoiding substance abuse, and staying connected to your social group. All of these things are basic, um, but they're really important. Um, and lastly, just keep focused on the future with hope and the past with gratitude. Next slide. So just circling back to where we started, courage and faith. Not only do we need to trust in God that he will give it, but we also need to seek it and we need to recognize it when it happens. We need to search out the presence of God in our lives and in our work. As it says here, I would have lo lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We need to look for those victories and those supplies that did come, the flowers in the courtyard and patients that discharged. This man that you can see here, he checked all of those boxes for not having a good outcome. He was elderly, he had comorbidities, but yet he, he survived. He, he benefited from the work and from the ministry that was provided and God had a plan for him. So I just really encourage you just to wait on God, be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. And just the next slide. And that's all for me. So just back to Lance here to close us out. Oh, Lance, I think you're on mute. Melanie, you are correct. <laughs> um, hey guys, great presentation. Um, just want to thank individually um, uh, ben, uh, Jim, and uh, Mel for just uh, giving a, another great presentation about uh, COVID-19 and, and where we're going uh, as an organization. Um, you guys did a great uh, job just uh, giving us updates about epidemiology, about the clinical aspects, and then I think more of the administrative and spiritual aspects. And um, so just indebted to you all for, uh, for being here today and taking time to give us this presentation. Um, we have some questions now from our audience. Um, Dr. Brown, I'm going to start off with you. This is, uh, I believe, maybe a, a colleague, uh, uh, Debbie Eisenhut. Um, I'm glad you're, um, she's asking you the question. Um, she says, in the mission hospital setting, should patients be offered ventilation and CPAP if full PPE, including N95 mask and tightly fitting goggles cannot be provided to ICU staff? 
Well, it's a good question that I think depends on the facility and the facility's capabilities and also how, they, um, how they're resourced. Um, where, I, where I am at Mbingo, I'm not there right now, uh, but I know the hospital and uh, I've actually recommended that they not try to ventilate patients there because it would, uh, we have a seven bed ICU. Um, it would literally take uh, the ICU away from other patients. Uh, we do have a, they have set up a place to um, put COVID patients uh, away from the main hospital. It's a separate building. They do have some PPE to, to, for the staff that are caring for those patients. I think that CPAP can be a very good alternative to intubation, but it does require training of the staff. Um, and it does require that you do it in an environment that's separated from the rest of your hospital. I think there are some hospitals, mission hospitals in Africa that may be able to do uh, ventilation, depending on how they're organized, uh, but it's not for every mission hospital. I think each hospital has to look at the resources. Innovation and ventilation takes a lot of resources and it will, and, and, and also those are the patients that um, are, are, are more likely not to survive. So you have to make some de tough decisions about rationing your, your resources, both your staff and your equipment. Great, thank you. Um, anybody else out there? Um, surely you have some other questions uh, for us. Um, so um, while we're waiting, I just have several. Um, Jim, I'll ask you, um, and, and you may have already answered this question, um, just the um, high incidence, incidence of hypercoagulability. Did you address, um, uh, I know you did in the inpatient setting, um, what are your recommendations about um, prophylaxis and maybe patients that are I would say mild, you know, mildly or moderately symptomatic, but um, are um, being tr managed on, on an outpatient basis. Is there any utility for um, prophylaxis in these patients? Well, Lance, I don't have any evidence to cite for you, but, uh, and again, we're dealing with a new disease and we're figuring some of this stuff out. My own recommend, I've been asked this question, and my own recommendation is that patients that have been hospitalized, uh, even if they don't have thromboembolic complications while in the hospital that they go home on prophylactic anticoagulation for one to three months. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't tell you that that's founded in evidence. It's just, it makes good sense to me though. Right. Okay, great. And then um, maybe just uh, another, one other clinical question is um, just, and in, in anybody feel free to answer this. I know there's been a lot of um, controversy about uh, therapeutics. Uh, antiviral therapies, and I know some have, um, you know, been thrust into popularity, and, and then there hasn't been a lot of um, substantiation there. Um, I, I, uh, I'm aware of IV uh, remdesivir. Any other um, uh, update on antivirals, maybe, that someone can uh, talk about? Remdesivir is the only drug approved right now, as of today, by the FDA. Um, the, uh, I think that uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin is now, uh, there's enough evidence to say not, it's not helpful and shouldn't, and maybe even harmful and shouldn't be used. There's been a lot of back and forth with that, as you all know, um, but I think we can put that one to aside. But um, other things that may actually, I'm interested to see what this, what will happen with this recommendation for steroids, although that's only in patients with severe disease, not the vast majority of patients. So I don't know um, beyond that, but there's a lot of stuff being looked at now in, the, in a very methodical and um, with the good studies that we'll eventually have some answers to. It's a new disease. And this was what was very difficult uh, for us initially was that we were dealing with something that nobody had seen before and for which we didn't have good evidence. So a lot of initial decision-making was made around very scanty or, or even uh, very poor data. So um, we're still figuring a lot of this out. Absolutely, yes. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, good questions here. Um, Steve Willing asked, does social distancing really prevent deaths or merely delay them? And then uh, we also have a, an, an additional comment. Um, it says, Mark, um, let Lipsitch predicted in the Atlantic um, that 40 to 70 percent of the world population would eventually be infected. So, anybody want to make a comment, Ben? 
So social distancing, um, it depends on what stage you're in. You can do er very, very early on uh, as part of um, a way of containing the outbreak. Uh, you know, uh, that, that way you could, could save deaths in that you could contain the outbreak uh, completely. Once you get into the mitigation stage, uh, it also uh, will save uh, lives in, in that um, you, have a, you have a finite amount of resources to combat uh, um, the outbreak. Um, think about it this way. Uh, if, if it did not save lives, then the, the, the case fatality rate would not change. Uh, even if you had all of your cases at once, it, you know, it, you, you would still have that 2.3% case fatality rate. They would just all happen, you know, in a week or whatever. Um, but the reason why you, it, it, it went up and say like, Sweden is because it went up so fast that it outpaced their capacity in their hospital system uh, to to provide beds and provide uh, healthcare workers and and provide all those things. Um, you know, uh, so it's not that it del just delays them. It 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 it, del it spreads it out enough that. Uh, you don't run out of capacity to treat and keep it at the 2.3%. Um, so yeah, uh, it, so it, it does save the excess deaths mm -hmm. is, is how you could put it. Right, good, good explanation, uh, Ben, thank you. Um, let's see, Jill Stevens um, says, as a family nurse practitioner preparing to go into a hot zone, how can an FNP best prepare to be effective and helpful to the team. For example, Dr. Brown mentioned a resource for non-intensivists. Yeah, um, this is, the Society for Critical Care Medicine has a link. You can register with them and then you will get updates um, regularly, sometimes almost daily. And, uh, but also they have links to almost every component of, uh, I'm th particularly thinking about critical care medicine, but. Uh, ventilator management, uh, hypotension, use suppressors, uh, all the links to almost everything. So I found that as a very great resource to go and just get protocols and recommendations for specific problems. They have all the ACLS protocols there, um, but that link is, uh, it's on the slide. I think people might be able to, to see it if they review the, um, the, uh, the webinar. Great. Okay, well, um, I think that really um, uh, brings us to the end here. I just want to conclude. I think, you know, these are very unprecedented times, but just an amazing opportunity for Samaritan's Purse to uh, reach out to so many people in need and to meet um, their needs where they're hurting, you know, physically and medically, and, and then just offer the um, unconditional love of Christ. And um, you know, I know these uh, three persons uh, with us today have certainly uh, been you know, incredible examples of that and uh, of the uh, of the Good Samaritan. And we just want to thank you guys for being with us today. I just want to remind you, um, CME credit is available for this session. Uh, the form and instructions are uh, will be in your email, uh, and we will be sending a follow-up email uh, with the link to this recording. If you are not on our email list, you can join the forum at health.samaritanspurse.org. Um, to learn about more uh, upcoming events with Samaritan's Purse and uh, various uh, webinar presentations. Next month, Wednesday, July the 8th uh, at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, we will be having Dr. Bill Rhodes. If you don't know Dr. Bill Rhodes, um, he's been serving for years in Western Kenya. Um, he's a plastic surgeon and general surgeon and just a phenomenal man of God. Um, his topic is to be determined. Uh, we really look forward to his presentation. With that, thank you so much for joining us and God bless. Thank you.